Hello everyone, today I'm talking to Brian Ingram. Now Brian, social media, he's known as BBD Brian. Brian is a mental health advocate. He has a diagnosis of quiet borderline personality disorder, something he refers to as the scapegoated disorder. And before we go any further, I would just like to ask Brian, why do you refer to it as the scapegoated disorder? Uh, I mean, well, mostly I can only go on my my experiences, but I think, you know, being in the BPD community, I I, I do see a lot of um, people, again, myself included, where quite often it's our reactions mm -hmm. that are weaponized. Um, and I think, especially with quite borderline, where it's very, like, implosive, where you kind of ruminate over stuff or you kind of think, oh, I'm not going to stand up for myself. Um, but I think, sorry, my mind's going all over the place. <laughs> but I think having been, I mean, with toxic families, I think you, like the roles can often change. I definitely feel like that happened with me. Um, depending on the family member and depending on who was nearest, I suppose. But I think for me, like, I felt like I was very much a scapegoat within my family and then you know that led to me going to familiar relationships like romantic or or you know friendships and stuff in adulthood where it I kind of got this vibe where I was just there to kind of sort of make up numbers or again to play a role of you know you'll look after our bags while we all go out smoking and then because we bought you a drink, you're not allowed to speak up for yourself. You're not allowed to call mm. us out on anything. Um, but because I think I can recognize like I was not, I had no backbone. I was very passive. Um, I think people saw that, but then because they would poke and poke and poke and poke, I would react. But to them, it looks like I'm reacting over one little thing when actually it's, you know, yeah, it's a series eight, of weeks, months of abuse. And then, I explode. Um, and also being in a chronically invalidating environment where if I did say to somebody, I don't like the way you've spoken to me, people would just be like, oh, well, you haven't taken your meds or you've got an attitude. Hmm. Uh, it was always about, I must have done something to make someone react some way. Some way. You were always held accountable. Yeah. Well, they got away or it was that kind of yeah I did do that but you did this or um yeah and I think especially at school for example I was very unpopular I was like the weird kid who like liked Pokemon and really cheesy pop music and even that was apparently a reason for people to bully me where people say oh well you bring it on yourself with that you're kind of weird hobbies and um but funnily enough people were back into Pokemon and stuff now. So um I'm like, mm, who's laughing? Well, goes now? around, comes around. It, it keeps yeah. Back, um it? but I think you know, it was always like, like I'd never witnessed anyone else again, I think especially in my family, them taking accountability. Okay. Um again it was always me that had to do the brunt of it. And I know we were talking just prior to the recording, you were diagnosed at the age of twenty six. Mm -hmm. when you got your diagnosis what changed for you did anything change for you um well so a, a bit of a background I think so when I've had a long history of mental health issues and you know going to the GP and being in mental health services but I felt like I was dismissed quite a lot where I was like oh it's just depression it's just anxiety here's some meds off you go and just because of, unfortunately, the way the system works, um, it would be like, oh, you're given like six sessions of therapy and then they're like, OK, bye. You're on your own again. So but um, I I think just before I got the diagnosis, um, I went through a breakup, which was wasn't great. I think um, the whole lower like some issues where, you know, like. I was sort of the other guy in the relationship, but it was this thing where they were like, oh, no, 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 it's over. I'm just waiting to leave the house, like to move out and stuff. Um, but so, but I think, so I think I was due uh, like a mental health assessment anyway. Um, and I was just like, 
it's it, it just for me it felt like it was more than depression and just anxiety so I kind of like started looking on mind websites and stuff and I came across BPD and um at the time I was like okay all these traits make sense so I brought it up in the assessment and it was like like a long thing I think I then got diagnosed so I think it was in the 2018 when I brought it up I got diagnosed in 2019 um and but the thing is it's one of those things I think being in a certain environment I feel like I was exhibiting all these traits out of survival and yeah almost like I didn't have space to breathe or a safe place to go and so I was very quick to react because you know was in a toxic household you know I I was being bullied by so-called friends and things like that so then the more and more things happened the quicker it was for me to be reactive to things um but when I got diagnosed at first I was like oh okay these again these traits make sense but then I like every thought and every behavior I was doing was like is this a BPD thing is this a normal thing Hmm. oh a lot of of questions reaction or am I actually rightly angry at this person or you know reacting to abuse or or bullying and stuff like that um and almost kind of suffocated myself I suppose um you know you know with quite BPD there is a lot of rumination and I think yeah it's a lot of second guessing yourself it sounds like yeah um and I think that does again come from this chronic invalidation where again I'm not being listened to my reality. My perception is always the one that's questioned or told is wrong. Um, yeah. Ask whenever you got your diagnosis, mm-hmm. did you keep it to yourself? Did you tell other people? Were you, uh, I mean, this is I'm curious. I'm just curious about other people's maybe reactions to you. Anything you might've picked up from them. Um, so there's this thing with me. I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's because, like, I have like autistic traits and stuff as well, and I overshare. Mm-hmm. But like, it's almost like I say things sort of without thinking. Where I'm just like, "Oh, I've got this diagnosis of BPD." Like, not thinking anything. I've just, just got this diagnosis. It doesn't have any weight behind it, sort of. Um, but you know, my mental health issues like my su- su- suicidality I, I said I really butchered saying that uh, <laughs> but you know with my mental health problems and you know again reacting to people's stuff like I was just seen as this difficult person or okay. you know this kind of person oh he's too sensitive oh he's always crying he's always doing this stuff and um again I think especially with my family it was just like oh god he's he, oh it's gonna it's gonna affect his mum again and oh, she's going to be worried, but they never actually wanted to understand what was going on. Mm. Um, and like I said, you know, I went through a breakup prior to the diagnosis, but I started thinking it was BPD like towards the end of the relationship. So I just simply sent like, I think it was like a seven minute video because I had no idea what was going on. It's like, oh, I think this is what I've got. Or I think it was like a video of like how to, understand somebody with bpd and this person was just like oh well am i not doing enough then just by me simply sending a video um but i i think it it was then i joined twitter um just because no one in my real life never wanted to fully understand me Mm. they never wanted to take that time so i was like well people talk about it online so kind of try and connect with people there um but quite a lot the I think the common misconception is people think when I said when I said I've got BPD like oh I've got bipolar too and so you know it's always this thing of like no no it's not it's not it's not bipolar um but I think with romantic relationships and I think you know to a point rightly so with them like they'd be like oh you know it doesn't matter that you've got that it's fine and then when I show symptoms uh, I think especially abandonment stuff like that's when I'm like, oh no no no, this is a bit too much um and 
for me it's now anyway is trying to unpack how much of it was me being like reactive how much was it me being too much on, or how much of it was because I think I went for these kind of dismissive partners and being gay as well like there seems to be sort of different rules when it comes to relationships a bit um just within like the, the kind of gay world and so quite often I would be called toxic or controlling because I'm like well I think you know you're being inappropriate with people online mm. and but that's me being toxic apparently or okay. you know heteronormative or whatever and it was always my boundaries that was weaponized and obviously I didn't know there were boundaries at the time um but or even just bringing up a genuine concern well for what it's worth I don't think heterosexual people like their partners flirting with others either so <laughs> <laughs> no, I, think, I, but I, I know I know what you're getting at but what what I'm what I'm hearing from you when you're referring to the scapegoated disorder it comes from a sense of being scapegoated Mm -hmm. in in your childhood whether that's at school or at home or the community you live in or whatever but once the disorder is there there's still a level of scapegoating because any reaction is out of proportion or any reaction mm -hmm. is unreasonable or any reaction must be the disorder mm -hmm. yeah and i've seen that again with being in the bbd community um people will often the trouble is, I think with screenshots, you don't, sometimes don't know the whole situation, mm. but quite often somebody will simply say, you know, I'm hurt that, you know, you didn't let me know when you came, came home last night or, you know, you spent all night out or you were chatting with your ex again or whatever. And it was always the same where their BPD was brought up. Mm. And I'm like, okay, it could be the BPD possibly. Mm -hmm. And, but at the same time, you chose to, again, you know, go and see your ex without telling your current partner mm. or, again, staying out all night and not letting you know when, when they're coming back. Mm. I feel like worrying is going to be a normal reaction, right? Like, oh, they, they haven't let me know where they, where they are all night. Um, and I think, again, even some normal things are seen as kind of control whereas I think you know with my partner for example like we're in a healthy relationship and you know I'll simply just be like, oh what are you up to this evening or oh oh uh, looks like sometimes he might um do something in town like why is it work and I was like oh how how was you know town or did you get up to much but some people will see that as like you checking up on them yeah and I'm like no I'm just asking a genuine question um but yeah sorry i'm trying to thought okay, okay. It's, it, again it's it's like asking how was your day mm -hmm. and it's a general question and maybe we are concerned with how someone's day was did i have a good day a difficult day or whatever and then there is that other aspect mm -hmm. of how was your day what were you up to what were you doing who were you talking to you know they, they are two completely different things mm -hmm. yeah and i think um as well i think because I, I think you know a lot of people say how your family dynamic is is kind of often what repeats in your mm, romantic yeah. relationships and um you know my upbringing was very much like oh well I bought you a playstation so you're being ungrateful or you're being selfish if you start yeah. you know shouting at your parent for doing something um or your sibling or whatever um and then I had a relationship where they did use gifts as kind of like, mm -hmm. oh, well, I just got this, like, I thought you'd like it. But then if I had plans to go out that evening, I'd be like, oh, you're just using me for presents. And I'm like, I didn't ask for this. <laughs> you sent it. Um, and it got to the point where when I went back to college, they didn't like me hanging out with certain people. People of the opposite sex, I might add, where I'm like, well, I'm gay, so <laughs> nothing's going to happen. Um, but also it was a 30 year old jealous of like a 17 year old. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, you know, the thing with red flags as well is like, wasn't really aware of them, but I think looking back, mm -hmm. there were some things where I was like, Oh, that seemed a bit off. 
Well, you see, this is the thing about red flags. It comes up all the time in the yeah. therapy room. It comes up all the time in social media, people talking about why didn't I see the red flags. Yeah. The thing about red flags are the person is not standing in front of you, waving them and saying, hey, look at what I'm doing. You know, yeah. they can be very subtle. They are a little piece at a time. You know, the gifts, for example, the gifts just come and they're surprises and they're nice. Mm -hmm. Maybe after a while, the gifts come. And then there are little caveats attached, little conditions attached. Mm -hmm. They're not brought up until you won't do what they want. Yeah. So in the mm -hmm. early stages, it's, you know, it, again, those red flags, we only see them with hindsight. Hindsight's not something we're born with. It only comes after the event. Yeah, I mean, because uh, I think one red flag that stood out to me with a previous relationship was uh, on the first date, they said that the previous relationships were relationships of convenience. Mm -hmm. And I was a bit like, I don't know what that means. And then they were saying that, you know, the last relationship was like a two-hour drive. So I was like, oh, that's not convenient. But then looking back at our relationship, I was like, oh, we do things when it's convenient for them. Mm. and it was a thing where they like a relative of mine passed while we were together and at first they were like oh well if you need any support you want me to come to the funeral just let me know then I asked them and they were like oh well no I'm going shopping that day and I was like okay and then I bring it up a bit later because I was like thinking hang on a minute that's not I was like Again, simply saying, like, I felt quite hurt that you won't support me just to go shopping. Mm -hmm. And it was this whole thing of like, oh, well, you're being inappropriate for asking. I don't see this person very often. Um, but also there was this kind of thing where, like, he kept, like, sort of breaking up with me. But then was saying, oh, I was doing it to get reaction out of you. Mm. Um. And it's kind of, I think that's the trauma bond as well, where yeah. I think with my abandonment issues, especially, I think, you know, we'd text, we'd talk, and it was all fine, but then I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, I'm really anxious. But then I get that text, and then I'm kind of, like, relieved again, and it's this kind of cycle that goes on. It's, uh, again, you mentioned the gifts, for example. Mm -hmm. Trauma bonding, it usually comes about through a series of both positive and negative reinforcement. Mm -hmm. You know, the the gifts, for example, the kindness, the love, the fun. But then there's also the punishment. There's the rejection. There's the cold shoulder. There's all of that sort of thing. So it's a series of both positive and negative reinforcement often happening at the same time. And what happens after a while is the person on the wrong end of that, they're no longer doing everything they can just to get the positive reinforcement. They're hoping it'll come because little breadcrumbs will come once in a while. Mm -hmm. What they're doing is they're doing the best they can to avoid and mitigate the negative reinforcement. Yeah, and I think like what you said there about the breadcrumb thing, I remember with this particular person, like even just getting a, a like a little text, I was like, oh my God, they're the best person ever. And I think unfortunately it's like kind of putting someone on a pedestal thing. Um, but I think that's where like I started to settle for the minimum. Mm -hmm. like, oh they sent a nice text today great <laughs> like, well done do you want an award for that um well you mentioned a moment ago about the abandonment i know uh the fear of abandonment and rejection is a, is a huge part of a borderline mm -hmm. how would you experience that um for me i think it's kind of all-encompassing i guess um I laugh about it now, but like it is something that can really get to me. Um, I'm a lot better with it with my partner, I think, just because building up trust and stuff. But especially with my previous relationships, it could be something as small as they might usually say, oh, good morning, babe, three kisses. Then the next morning, if they just put good morning without the babe, it's still three kisses. I'm like, oh, God, they're going off me. I've done something wrong. Mm. Um, but then I'm constantly messaging like, have I done something wrong? Have I done something wrong? Oh, you're not responding, so I have done something wrong. Oh, have I done something wrong? But then they do get mad because <laughs> I'm kind of constantly trying to find out what's going on. And they're like, no, it wasn't like nothing was wrong, but you keep messaging me. 
So it sounds like it's it's constantly looking for reassurance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And again, it, I think again the kind of trauma bonding thing is like, oh, then I got that, I got that reassurance. Mm-hmm. Then they're not talking again, or something else happens, and I'm like, oh, so this is the reason why they're going off me. Um, and sometimes I think uh, you know because I watched your videos about kind of scapegoat golden child um but i watched the one about the lost child i think we actually spoke about it before about kind of being hidden in plain sight yeah and it's got to this point i think i don't know whether it's kind of being out of touch with reality <laughs> or not but sometimes it could be the like a silly example would be that i could be in the queue to get a coffee and someone cuts in front of me there would be the split second of like i don't exist am i invisible can people see me? Um, and then I'm just, because, you know, I think people so often talk about, you know, a lot of like narcissism, for example, as being quite entitled and stuff like that. And I think for me, it's like very much the opposite. I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be here. Or maybe I accidentally pushed in somewhere and always feel like I'm taking up too much space. Um, and that's not uncommon with quiet borderline that I don't deserve. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, um, Because I think sort of like with my family dynamic, again, I think especially after my dad passed when I was 15, everything became about my mum making sure they were okay. Um, and so us kids, our, ne- our, our needs weren't important. Mm. We were being selfish for grieving or, or, or anything. Um, and, yeah, so I started to develop this, form of hypervigilance where it's like okay this is something i should be happy about but what if this upsets this person because i'm happy about this or they're feeling stressed today so i shouldn't be happy and it's almost like i'm always gauging or or even asking for approval about my emotions from other people Mm -hmm. and i think that's unfortunately what can lead not just me but i think people with quite bpd and like quite vulnerable people to be abused or be taken advantage of yeah. because you're seeking this external validation. People can say, no, you're wrong for feeling that. No, you're wrong for wanting to move away or you're wrong for cutting this person off. Mm-hmm. You're wrong for like having being the one being like, Oh, is this right or wrong? Mm-hmm. Um, I think because having a lifetime of other people telling me what I am, what I'm not, what I can, what I can't do. Um, I think the other thing with scapegoating, for example, like with my upbringing, um, it was very much this thing where I think, you know, I can recognise with being neurodivergent and stuff, I think I was a slow kid where something could happen, I'd just stand there and I don't know what's going on. Um, But what would happen would be that they'd tell me I'm incompetent and that I can't do something. So I internalise that and think, okay, well, I won't do it. But then when I do do it, I get told that I'm not doing it properly. Mm. So I learned to, I think pretty much I was like, well, I won't do anything then because then I can't get. Yeah, that's. I'd rather get criticized for not doing something than doing it. And it always just seemed this kind of, I can't win. It's like, hey, you tell me I can't do something. But then when I don't do the thing you say I can't do, you still get mad. And, um, or even, for example, I moved out last year. Like literally, I think it was a week before. Um, one of my relatives said to me, "Oh, you won't move without. You can barely look after yourself." And then I got the flat, and I bumped into them. I think they were like walking with a friend, walking a dog. And again, it's all kind of keeping up appearances in front of their friend. Like, "Oh, congratulations on the move. If you need any help," but there was still a snide comment of like, mm. "By the way, pasta bake doesn't count as cooking." And it was always this kind of sly. Yeah thing in there you know i often think it's the it's the child that was hidden in plain sight it tries to hide in plain sight they they don't necessarily want to do something wrong because that's going to bring a wrath that's going to bring punishment they don't necessarily want to do anything too outstanding because Mm -hmm. that's going to bring scorn and criticism so it's almost like trying to stay in this tight little operating small comfort zone Sort of yeah, and I think that's where I also developed this kind of fawning response where I've I've kind of 
it's almost like it's a bit like mirroring i think but for example one of like my abusive relatives like they liked bragging about the kind of toxic stuff they've done Mm -hmm. so but for me i was like oh well that's a way to talk to them Mm. And I'm like, oh, do you remember when you did this? Even though, like, internally, like, that's not right. <laughs> but it's a way it's to, to kind of have accepted, a conversation without, yeah. It's to be uh, accepted. And this is the thing about acceptance. Every single one of we are social creatures. Every single one of us need to be accepted on some level. We like to be liked. We like people to think we're decent. We like people to think we're attractive, funny, intelligent, all the rest of it. it mm-hmm. It's hardwired into us. When we don't get that, it can be very demeaning. It can be very dehumanizing, very devaluing. No one likes rejection. And this is something I talk about in therapy quite a lot with people. When we look at that need to be accepted, if you look at things the opposite way around, sometimes they make more sense. It is not the need to be accepted. It is the fear of being rejected, Mm -hmm. which is why we sometimes start to mirror people, which is why we start to do certain things that we think they will accept us for even when they go against maybe our core values Mm -hmm. and this is where like sometimes i i joke of of saying you know like oh you don't like me i've mirrored your entire personality so you're sure you don't like yourself Mm -hmm. (laughs) like i'm showing yourself back um or i think again i think with people i had growing up not just family but also friends they would be the ones to tell me to stand up for myself but if I stood up for myself to them, they didn't like mm. it. And I was like, hang on, a, hang on a minute. You were telling me to get more of a backbone. Um, but when it comes to you, you want me to be this passive person that doesn't say anything. Um, well, again, this is the thing about being accepted. Sometimes we need to look at the caliber of the people that we want mm-hmm. to accept us. You don't, we don't look at, what they are, where they are. We look at who they are. Mm-hmm. Are they really the kind of people you want to be accepted by? And I think, you know, you saying that, I think that's, I think that is why people then gravitate towards similar relationships of what they had with their family. Or like, I think for me, like my um, ex before the partner I'm with now, it was literally like, oh, he literally comes across as the kind of person that would bully me at school mm. and was this quite brash, like, broad guy. So I was like, oh, so he likes me. Oh, let's try and get his approval because somebody like that would have bullied me, like, 10 years ago. And then that's where I start. I think there's that whole kind of, like, being attracted to bad boys sort of thing um, where it's like, okay, well, but, you know, it's like, oh, well, I'm attracted to bad boys until they're bad. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think I, I think, again, being in a small town and not really at that point having that confidence to make other friends and stuff, you do stick with people mm-hmm. that aren't great or just people you went to school with and just realising as people, adults. Are just It's people we're familiar with. Again, mm-hmm. a lot of the relationships tend to repeat because it's what we're familiar with. Mm-hmm. I think maybe it's an unconscious thing. We're thinking, if I try hard enough this time, maybe with this person it will work. Maybe I'll bring out the best in them this time. Yeah, and I think um, I sometimes sort of cringe at like my fawning responses. Sometimes I think you know, because it is that oh no, no, I'll do anything for you. I'll do, I'll do, I'll do this, and um, you know, I've literally like with the abuse of x before my partner it was me groveling being like i'm so sorry i won't do that and apologizing for my again my reactions to things and to the point where this person was like oh well i lost love and respect for you when i found out you did that and i think it was weird because i think i learned um because basically i brought it up in therapy and i also asked somebody who was around growing up if I made this up or whether it was something that happened but basically a relative of mine who was an adult um would do this weird game of like crying into their hands saying oh nobody loves me to get kids attention Mm. and you know like kind of processing that I'm like like, okay maybe they're not getting their needs met or that's how they get people to 
give them what they want. Yeah, um, but also thinking oh, that's very manipulative to do that to a child. Mm. Um, but I think also though I I think I learned that because in a weird way I think like with with my family like they would often bully me and abuse me, but if I was bullied at school, they'd be the first ones to be like, oh no no we're gonna sort that out for you. Come on, mm. let's go, and that like they'll start you know having fights. So then I think, oh, that like they they're not horrible to me then because they're standing up for me. Yeah. Um but followed by that line of like, oh no, we're the ones that bully you. We're the ones that are allowed to say stuff like that because we're your family. Mm-hmm. Um but I think I sort of learned that people only noticed me when something was wrong. And for the longest time that did happen where I could have a crisis. Somebody who I haven't spoken to in three years shows up and helps me. But then as soon as I'm better, I don't hear from them. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, why are you doing this then? Is it just to look good? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think also with keeping up appearances, you know, I, you know, with the stuff that I do, like I, I won an award last year and one of my abusive relatives messaged me saying, oh, I'm so proud of you. And because I kind of called that out, all of a sudden, like, they don't have social media anymore. On social media, they're the ones that are like, oh, oh, love you, cousin, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you don't talk to each other. You last saw them, like, six years ago, and you live in the same town. Mm. Whereas me, I don't buy into that. But because I'm calling that stuff out, I think they're like, oh, no, Brian's hiding. Because look at all us, we're we're lovey dovey on social media, so this proves that we're all lovey dovey in real life. And I'm like, well, no, you're not. <laughs> um, but then when I started doing stuff on TikTok and things like that, that's when I'd get the comments being like, oh, well done, cousin. Oh, how are you? I'm like, you've ignored me for twenty years. You ignore me when I walk past you in the street. But I'm not going to suddenly cop to you suddenly supporting me. Mm-hmm. And. But again, you know, with the person that made a snide comment of being like, oh, well, pasta bake doesn't count as cooking. When their friend was like, oh, I really like your TikToks. Like, they'd be like, oh, well, he had nothing else to do. He doesn't have a job. And I, and I was like, at this point, I was like, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Hardly anyone's working at the moment. Mm-hmm. Why has it got to be a jab about what, about my character or what I'm doing or not doing? And, you know, like, I'm still building up to wanting to go back to work. You know, I, I've, I've got this friend, I used to think he was very clever, very witty, and he would come up with these amazing nuggets of wisdom. So you can imagine my disappointment when I found out it wasn't him at all saying these things. It's been <laughs> a while, you know. One of his expressions is, what other people think of me is none of my business. Mm-hmm. And I think with that is, I think it's hard trying to unpack that mm-hmm. because... You know, we are so for sure. a good two decades, it was very much like, oh, other people's opinions are the right ones of you. When human beings are accepted, whenever they feel encouraged, whenever they feel heard and whenever they feel listened to, that's when they feel part of something. And it doesn't matter if people are disagreeing with them mm-hmm. because they still feel a part of something. They still feel as if they're a human being. Yeah, I mean, so I think one thing that stands out with what you're saying there is that... um Two of my relatives, they had this very rocky relationship. They would be best friends. They'd fall out. They'd see each other at a family reunion. They're best friends again. And then they're bitching about each other again. And again, it's this, it was the same person that likes making snide comments. But basically, again, with, I think, you know, before fully cutting people out, like I did have some like relatives comment on something like on Facebook or something. I'm just like, Thank you. But then this other relative was like, oh, I see your best friends with this person. I see you're hanging out with them. Like, what's between you two is between you two. I don't know what's gone on, but don't make that my problem just because I wrote a simple thank you to somebody. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, with the nuances of that, though, I think, you know, I think especially with abusers and stuff, if people, if you do come forward to somebody and say, oh, this person abused me, but they still want you to be around this person or whatever. I'm like, well, no, then this isn't a good fit. Mm. I'm not going to tell you that you can't be friends with them, but then 
I'm sorry, I have to walk away. Um, but I think, again, for me, not having a like a backbone at all, like I think a, 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 with the being invisible as well, though, would be the thing where I'd be very quiet. Then I'm like, oh, I'm building up the com- confidence to say something. And then they're like, oh, who do you think you are? So then I go back in. I done like I think I think it was this morning, um, like a, a like a silly little TikTok thing about kind of where people will say, you know, oh, stop talking about the abuse you went through online or stop talking about your abusers online. That should be a private matter. When I'm like, well, that's how the abusers thrive by keeping it quiet. Mm. And people are like, oh, but you're playing the victim. It's like, okay, but I've been quiet about this for twenty plus years. So only because I'm a, and again, then people will be like, oh, well, why don't you say this to their face? I'm like, so you're encouraging victims to confront their abusers. Why? Mm. It's always about something the victim's doing wrong. Yeah. Um, and I think somebody said, like, how they kind of process it is saying, you know, well, if they didn't want to be spoken badly about, they shouldn't have done those bad things. You're talking about the tech talk and so on. So it's okay, maybe talk about your social media work and, your advocacy and so on what's your experience of social media uh well so when i was a teenager that was when facebook and i think like bebo and stuff was really popular um but also the time of the internet where like there was not great security and stuff um and i think this is the other weird disconnect for me because obviously i was bullied a lot at school but then I'd get all these friend requests on Facebook from people I go to school with, mm. even though like they bullied me. So I'm like, does that mean we're friends? Do they like me then? Or mm. is it just a thing because everyone is just adding each other from school? Mm. Um, but I think I'd always, I think again, you know, like that kind of no filter thing I said before where. I will say, like, oh, I've got BBD, or I'll say someone's done something, not thinking, like, oh, I shouldn't be saying that they've done this thing. Um, and so, you know, I think social media quite early on was a place for me to escape and have my own opinions and, you know, talk about, you know, interests like, like Pokemon or like the music I like, where other people like that stuff um so it was almost a bit like oh people are not but then what would happen though I remember like a weird mindset I had I I don't know know if it's a trauma thing or not but I'd be like oh this person likes Pokemon that means they're going to be a good partner like it's yeah this kind of weird kind of dissidence thing but yeah like you know I'd I think I was 14 though I think the first time someone told me to kill myself like online mm-hmm. um and you know my you know I, I i i would put up silly like like facebook statuses like again it's weird things i'm like oh my relative did this or like, or like this happened at school and then people be like oh well that's not what happened though is it and again but because then it started coming to this thing where again like even with social media again my my perceptions were still questioned um but because I um so I, I don't mean to interrupt but when you're talking about the first time someone told you to kill yourself I mean mm. what was that like for you just to have someone actually say that albeit it's maybe through a message on a platform I That's I don't really remember hilarious. I don't really remember it um but again, it was another thing where then my family would jump on to defend me. What? But then, you know, once that's finished, they'll come in shouting at me. Um, so again, this weird kind of mm-hmm. almost like two worlds are going on. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think also like we again with, you know, that was around the time I came out as, as gay as well. Um but again, it was, like, I ended up being in chat rooms where then kind of older men groomed me. Um, I think a lot of people like, around my age are kind of speaking up about that now because I think we're now at that age to recognise that. Mm. Um, 
to the point I remember once I was I was at school and I was taken out a science I think it was a science lesson um by the nurse um and, and at this point I think my dad wasn't very well so I was like oh it's probably something to do with my dad like maybe like he's gone to hospital or something but then there was like a police officer there um and they said that like I was being targeted by like a local pedophile online and it was one of those things I think I started to think oh it's my fault because Maybe I think sure. I think unfortunately as well you know teens with hormones and stuff and then obviously adding like being gay on top I think there was a lot of kind of teenagers kind of talking to each other in sexual ways and stuff and uh, and stuff like that but because of how some people reacted to me being gay as well I was like, oh it's shameful I've been doing something wrong um but I, I don't know if my parent if like because I know they had to obviously tell my parents stuff but I'm not sure to what extent they know um but yeah so I think going back to the actual question um with social media I think Again, I, I joined Twitter in 2018. Again, when trying to understand BPD and stuff. Um, but again, it was this that again that disconnect of like, oh, other people with a disorder or people that aren't in my life are wanting to understand me. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I can be safe in showing my opinions and stuff. Because um, this year, like um, a relative was like. Oh, Brian's hiding behind his followers, or if only people knew the real Brian. And I'm like, okay, first of all, you weren't there for 15 years of my life. Um, secondly, if you mean the real me, do you mean like the reactive person to my family's abuse? Um, and it was another thing where, like, basically they were like, oh, Brian's also hiding behind his sexuality. Mm -hmm. They've been openly homophobic, or saying that like they don't like gay people because of their religion. And but for me, I was like, okay, now they're grasping at straws because if they knew me as a person, yeah, they would know that I don't believe in, you know, oh, you can get away with stuff because you're gay or whatever. So they're trying to find ways to kind of make twist things. But... It's, yeah, a lot of the time it's trying to find something that justifies their own narrative. Yeah, and I think, you know, like, um, I think every single person joined tiktok in in like the first lockdown because there was nothing else to do um but <clears throat> it started just doing kind of little comedy skits because i think that's just what everybody was doing you know kind of like lip syncing and stuff which is another full circle moment because i was always like like the kid that would like walk around listening to music and lip syncing which i was taking the piss out of and now like you know i've got a fair amount of follow followers on there so i'm like again full circle moment there um but then I was like, okay, well, obviously I'm doing mental health advocacy on Twitter, um, but I think video form and kind of talking is easier for me because sometimes I struggle with like, like writing. So I was like, okay, I'll start showing more of my experiences. Um, but this this thing would happen, I think, especially with like the gay following I had. So I'd be showing my experiences and people would sort of use that as a way to then start being flirty. Mm -hmm. And initially I'm like, okay, well, that's fine. You know, adults are adults, you know, think that maybe it's just a way to make conversation. But then as soon as they lose interest or, you know, someone else has come along or, you know, I don't respond to their message because they, they want to talk about something then it would be like, oh, you're doing this for attention. Oh, you're a fake. You're 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 yeah. a fame hungry whore. And I'm like, okay, so you liked it when you could have got something from it. Yeah. Um. But now that I haven't, because I, I I think there was once where somebody had sent a message and I had said, okay, oh, I'll, I'll I'll get back to you tomorrow. But then something happened um with my family. So obviously, time went on and I literally forgot. And again, it was a thing of like, oh, you're just doing this for attention. You're fake. Yeah. And I think what happens is, particularly with social media, mm. now it doesn't matter whether it's an article someone's written or it's just a post they've put up or it could be a video, a YouTube video, TikTok video, whatever it is. I think people see that 
And what they do is they create a version of that person in their own head. Mm-hmm. And they either love them or they hate them. Now, there's probably a lot of stuff in between, but I'll go with the two extremes. They either love them or they hate them. And if that person does not meet the version of them that they have created, mm. you know, some people are fine. They'll say, oh, okay, it's not what I thought it was or whatever. And then, but other people, it's like they can't cope with that. They find it very, they struggle with it. I think that's part of the issue with like online dating as well, because <laughs> obviously people can, you know, put the best versions of themselves out there. Um, yeah. But yeah, just because then I think, you know, where this again, where things where you do have this pattern or like, these things happen multiple times, you're like, oh, maybe I'm a fake. So I'm not helping everyone. But, you know, I've got to remind myself, I'm not a therapist. I'm not trained for that stuff. If I if I don't see that message, I don't see that message. But even if I do see that message, I do not have to respond. With obviously the stuff that I do as well, obviously talking about BPD, though, I think because of the stigma, Mm. I will then get people come onto my comment section and will be like, oh, well, my ex had BPD, you deserve the stigma. I'm like, oh, so I deserve the stigma because of what your ex has done. Yeah. Or it'll be like, oh, my, my brother's niece's girlfriend's brother had BPD Mm -hmm. and they were a horrible person. Mm. Or I've heard this because I think the other thing as well, like what I found about my experiences as well, is that people would be like, oh, well, I've heard different about you or I've heard this. I'm like, exactly, you heard it. And a bit like when I said to you about the quote of, you know, some people don't want to hear your side of the story because the side they heard They've already made their mind up. About you. Yeah, you know, I've had people make outright lies about me and saying, um, cause I had somebody who, who's like a long time follower of me on TikTok. They messaged me being like, Oh, this person said, stay away from you. Cause you're an attention seeking something. Mm-hmm. And, and, Oh, you stole this person's clothes. I was like, I was at the house once. And I did not leave their site except for going to the toilet. Mm-hmm. And, but I think now I'm just like, okay, people are going to believe what they want to believe. But you mentioned an award. What's the award you want? I think so. Last year it was it was with mental health blog awards. I think it was like social media champion of the year or something. Social um, media champion. Yeah. Um. It's although it's like uh, you know talking about social media is definitely a thing where it's like it has helped me a lot. And I think with a lot of disabled people as well, where they don't get out much, it is a safe place for them. Mm-hmm. But as we've discussed, it's also very like toxic and it can be very can be damaging as well dark, but i think the good side of it is it does allow people to connect with each other mm-hmm. it, it's instant communication it is instant information and it can open up it can open up a, a social network to people mm-hmm. who otherwise wouldn't get one i think there is that really really good side to it having to navigate that with maybe the the vitriol and so on that you see yeah, and I think that's why, like, even just because I think we often talk about having boundaries with other people is having boundaries with yourself. Oh yeah. So for me, like, I've pre- I think I've pretty much got all of my social media notifications off on my phone. I think the only kind of messaging thing I get is WhatsApp and normal iMessages. Um, just because I'd be very ruminative or. Again, that kind of doom scrolling as well. Like, oh, mm. this, who's this? especially if you know if it comes up like that, you're like, oh, they've messaged. There's a nerd to check it. And then there's also that incentive, like, oh well, I've got to get back to them then. Um, whereas having my notifications off, I can be like, sorry, I didn't see this. Um, but also, I'm like, okay, I will respond to it when I want to, when I feel like I can. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the other thing, you know. You, sometimes my boundaries with other people is for myself because quite often I felt like because I was this person that was open about my mental health I had people literally view me as a therapist I had a friend say to me let next friend say oh well you're basically like a therapist so I was already just trying to survive and then had everyone else unloading their stuff on me and then I think oh well I can't not listen and then I'm exhausted. Um, you know, I also don't answer because, you know, I had somebody who I've had like two conversations with in my entire life. They started ringing me on 
Facebook Messenger. I was like, I'm not answering them. Mm. Like, why are you ringing me? <laughs> um, and but yeah, I think it's. I think that's been the biggest change for me. I think um, also personal responsibility. You know, I can be responsible for my stuff. I'm not responsible for others. Yeah. Um, and that's been a massive change for me. I think, again, you know, with, you know, you know, like being scapegoated and stuff where you are made to feel like you're responsible for other people's emotional state or, you know, their behaviours and stuff. And I think the difficult part with boundaries is discerning whether it's you know it's just somebody that's getting used to your boundaries versus somebody that just outright won't respect them yeah. um i often think it's not just communicating them it's how we reinforce them because if we don't reinforce them people will cross them right but i'm also aware of the time i know we're coming towards the end i'm just wondering people want to follow you online where are they going to find you I think pretty much on everything. So TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, um, YouTube. I don't do YouTube as much as I should. I uh, think like it's filming longer videos. It takes a lot more like mental effort. Um, but I think also like basically I had a relative say to me that nobody cares what I have to say. So sometimes I'll go and record a video. I'll get halfway through or almost done. I'm literally like, nope, not doing that, press stop recording, and then I don't post it because I'm like, oh, nobody cares. Um, and, yeah, because I think even, even like, doing this, I'm like, oh, God, how did I come across? Did I come across okay? Am I being terrible? Um, in every single one of us, every single one of us did. Now, I'm sure there's people out there who do the YouTube stuff. You, let's start that again. YouTube stuff just like I do. Yeah. And when I watch them, I'm always blown away by how slick they are. Whereas I'm just kind of sitting there and I'm going, well, you know, and it's a bit like this and, you know, common behavior would look like that. You know, it, I come across like I'm just a waffling old man, you know, but <laughs> some people seem to get something out of it. So fair enough. Yeah, I think. Um, also, I've noticed I say I think a lot. Um, I think because I think because. Whenever I was sure of myself that's when people are like, oh you think you know it all you think you're better than blah blah so now i'm like oh if i say i think if people think differently nothing's gonna happen <laughs> they're entitled to just like the opinions everybody has one mm. so. yeah i think it's just trying to you know they often say you know pe with people pleasing you end up not pleasing anyone yeah. um so <laughs> Yeah, it's trying to, I think, also, like... It's only... finding a balance. It's And if you think of the, the stuff... I mean, I've watched your videos on YouTube. haven't seen anything on TikTok. But whenever you're putting something out there, you're just being genuine. You're just telling your story. Right, yeah. And I think that's, again, something that I constantly like, kind of remind myself of is, you know people are entitled to their opinions including the people that have abused me or bullied me and but that shouldn't mean i have to be quiet or that oh, you're entitled to your opinion it. as well you're um, entitled as well and again it's that thing where i'll be like oh i don't care like i can say what i want and then again i'll be crying about it uh, <laughs> when i do get a horrible comment um happens less now i think um actually a good point I got to, um, so I told you about somebody that kept leaving comments and like attacking my sexuality, blah, blah, blah. So a few months ago, I met up with a friend from college who my partner at the time didn't want me talking to and, you know, finding out stuff. And then I did a video talking about this partner and I got a comment saying, well, I've spoken to your family and I've sp spoken to your partner and this is not what happened. You, you're the one that would rage if you didn't get gifts, blah, blah, blah. And I think before I would have had a massive meltdown, like, oh, my God. And But this time I was like, delete. It was one of those things I was like, yeah. type out a comment. And I was like, nope, nope, just delete, move on. And then I went to sleep. Like, there, there is something to be said for that old <laughs> saying, never send an email in, in anger. Draft it, then read it the next morning so listen yeah. what i'm going to do um i will put your details in the description of this video for where people can find you on social media and i'll encourage them to 
follow you, have a look, see what you have to say and then learn a bit more about borderline personality and mental health advocacy. Thank you very much for having me. Well, it's been lovely chatting with you today. Do you take care? You too. Thank you. Who knows? Maybe we'll do this again sometime. I hope so. That'll be really good. Thank you.